Hello, everybody, and welcome to this latest in the Values Jam guest session series. Katie, brilliant to have you here. So to start with, please, could you introduce yourself and tell everybody about the great work that you do? So, um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm Katie Antill, and I'm the Chief Executive of ADSS, Alzheimer's and Dementia Support Services. Um, we are a um, obviously a dementia charity. We're based in Kent, uh, and... Um, we work with people who are affected by dementia from early pre-diagnosis all the way to end of life. And um, I've got a team of about 100 people that are just doing incredible, incredible work with those that we support. Uh, um, if you want to know more, then follow me on LinkedIn because I'm always sharing the great work that we do there. So you can look me up quite easily on LinkedIn. Okay. And I think that this area of dementia and Alzheimer's uh, even recently, I kind of realized how much more serious it was than I had previously thought. So my my perception of it was, well, you can't remember stuff, right? That, that was it. Um, but then there was, there's been a video doing the rounds on social media about this guy, he's on a plane. And have you seen this at all or not? No, I haven't, no. So he's on a plane in America. Um, he has dementia. His wife has gone to the bathroom and he's confused, doesn't know where he is, and doesn't know why all these people are looking at him, and he's becoming very aggressive. Oh. Um, then when his wife comes back from the bathroom, he doesn't recognise her um, and is aggressive to her and everybody. Uh, she explains the situation and everybody starts to calm down a bit because until then they, uh, you know, they didn't know what was happening either. Mm. And uh, then it shows how uh, she shared with all of the people what their wedding song was. And everybody sang it and the guy calmed down oh. and eventually nodded off. Oh. It's, I'll, I'll try and dig out the link and send yeah. it. To you. Oh, that is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. But it, like I say, the, that, the whole aggression bit, it was like, wow, that, that's, a, that's how you be, can end up behaving because of the situation right? absolutely absolutely and and yeah so many people living with dementia are unfortunately put in that situation where th their frustration and their inability to articulate what what it is that's frustrating them or upsetting them or distressing them uh, means that their behavior just escalates and that that you know there's quite a huge stigma around this behavioural thing with people with dementia, but quite often it is just an expression of unmet needs. It's just that they just can't say what they need and can't get what they need. Um... Mm, okay. So here is the Values Jam card deck. Um, well, you've got yours there, actually, haven't you? I have. I have so indeed. Let's, yeah. let's, let's use yours then. So okay. um, why don't you uh, tip the cards out and make uh, five piles in front of you? Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then um, how are the, are the piles in a straight line or? They yeah. are, yeah. yeah. Right. So if you go, if you start on your left hand side, if you choose pile four. Yep. Yeah. And how many cards are there? I've got six, nine cards. All right. So let's have number seven. Okay. So show the card to the camera. Come on, what is it? Just one. Okay. So um, the first question, Katie, is what does justice mean? And what does it look, sound, and feel like for you? Okay. So I think um, I haven't picked an easy one here, have I? <laughs> we'll see where we go with it. Okay. So I think to me, Justice means um, basically people getting what should happen, happen really. So I think, you know, it, it's it's really hard to take out of your head things like criminal justice, isn't it? Where if people's, uh, people have um, 
committed a crime then they get what 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 they deserve basically yeah um but i think for for me working with older adults working in kind of the social care system i i feel it also for me it also really means around um there being some sort of justice in terms of what people get and um really it's also really sort of connected to yeah people's rights and their humanity for me as well yeah and and what about the the metaphor part of the question when you when you think of the word justice what images come to mind what sounds come to mind and what feelings come to mind um so yeah I, I suppose because of that kind of criminal justice a lot of this perhaps a lot of the soundy type things are quite related to courtrooms and prison cells and that sort of thing uh, um and I, I think in that in that context a bit a bit of fear comes to my mind I, I feel you know I always feel that they're deliberately designed to be places of, of fear, aren't they? And to to frighten frighten people. And it it certainly it, the imagery certainly does does that for me. So yeah, and it's I, I think you said at the beginning that it, you've not chosen an easy one, and it's a, a bit of a challenging card. And I agree with you because when <clears throat> when I think about justice, I'm reminded of actually a, a couple of values jam conversations. One um nearly when or I thought that it was going to go pear shape the conversation it was a small group of about five and the lady that spoke first said um I feel really anxious about this card uh, and the reason for that is that the only reason you need justice is because there has been an injustice mm-hmm. and that makes me feel really bad and she went off on a bit of a rant and um I'm thinking oh my goodness what what do we do here but I thought best you know just leave it and see what happens and one of the other guys said um that's really interesting that you've uh, framed it like that because for me uh what was he? he said something like justice is when you're removed from the heat of the situation so that you can decide what the outcome should be, and you can put that in place. And then she suddenly calmed down and she said, oh, that's, that's amazing. I've really never thought. And then the conversation was great. But to your point, I think justice is one of these words that it's very emotional and like you've intimated in a probably negative way, like when you think of prison sentences and all that sort of stuff. And then the language that you said, uh, you know, you get what you deserve, that, mm. that kind of thing. Um, but in, in uh, I think it's in Zulu society, I heard a story, I don't know whether this is true or not, but apparently when somebody does something bad in a Zulu tribe, what happens is that the elders make a circle around the person and then they tell the person stories about when they've been really good and that's their version of dealing with somebody misbehaving and when I heard that I thought oh my god that seems so much more enlightened Mm. our you know natural reaction to punishment and (laughs) get what you deserve type of thing what do what's your thoughts on that yeah I, I I love that it does seem a lot more enlightened doesn't it because you know I'm I'm, I'll, I'll reveal a little guilty pleasure, but I absolutely love Desert Island Discs. And a few weeks ago, they were interviewing the new um, director of um, the Prison Reform Trust or whatever they're, they're, they're called. Uh, and um, and it was absolutely brilliant. And and really, she just articulated beautifully that locking people up in a cell is not going to change their behaviour and is not going to enable them to then come out and um and and yeah and do any good for society so it yeah I I I really I love that having yeah telling people what they've done good because that's as a as a leader of an uh, um of, of a team I really try and do that kind of showing people what success looks like showing people what good looks like so that when they 
it really comes down to their behaviors then that then their behavior uh, think oh yeah you know she wants more of the same of that really rather than just pointing out to people when they've done something wrong all the time it none of us as humans like that do we it's 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 not good for any of us um yeah and I think that's uh, that's where I am with the like the justice system because actually it doesn't tell anybody what they should be doing no you know it just deals with correcting some well and not really correcting because it's being done so what what uh, it's not actually doing any correction um and yeah, I'm thinking back to when I used to work in corporate roles, I, if I was running teams, I used to kind of, I made a conscious choice that I would starve oxygen from people when they were doing bad things. Because I just intuitively, I don't know if there's any theory behind this, but I just felt that if you make a fuss about them, then it just draws attention and it puts them in the spotlight and spreads the word. So I chose to deal with things, you know, quickly and quietly if things weren't right, but then make all the song and dance about stuff when it was right. Yeah. So then everybody starts to see the, the positive behaviour that you want reinforced and nobody really notices very much about the stuff that you're putting right. Um, and like I said, I've never found any evidence about that, so I've no idea whether it was <laughs> the right thing to do or not. <laughs> Okay. And um, what about, so if we get a bit more practical now, um, where have you noticed a lack of justice? Oh, don't get me started on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, um, for people that know me probably know that I am a bit of a social justice warrior. So, um, I, and a lot of the work I do, um, is really around trying to create fair, which is a big part of what I think justice is, is trying to create create fairness for for people, um, yeah, people that are being marginalised, people pe for too long, people living with dementia have basically been forgotten about and treated as, yeah, sub subhuman really, once they get that diagnosis of dementia and, yeah. um, and less important. So um a big part of the work that that we do um and particularly particularly the work I do is kind of really almost battling the system to make sure those injustices don't don't show up you know I can if you want me to I can tell you some horrible stories of people living with dementia being denied medical care for cancer because people don't think that it's worth giving them treatment for a skin cancer on their head just because they've got a diagnosis of dementia or unable to access treatment for something like a hernia just because they've got dementia and they're seen as not worthy of, of being given that basic fundamental right of being pain-free and able to live live a good quality life. Uh, why, why does anybody think that it should make any difference? I think um, because somebody's got an incurable illness of dementia, they think that they, yeah, something's going to get them in the end. And I think there's such a stigma around people having dementia that people think that actually it'd be better if a skin cancer gets them sooner rather than, I, I think that that's all I can think is people's perception that, you know, they're better off being taken sooner rather than later when their dementia is more advanced. Uh, um, but of course, you know, it's incredibly, incredibly hurtful for that person. And it's also absolutely awful for their family member as well to know that the loved one is in, in pain and perhaps unable to articulate it fully, but yeah, not being, their health needs not being met. So yeah, that's where I notice, um, and my team do, and um, and that's one thing I'm very proud of that I've achieved at ADSS in the five and a bit years that I've been there, actually, is our work's always been incredible, but we didn't really have a particularly loud voice, and we weren't prepared to kind of battle the system um, so much, but now I've got a team of people that know what's right and know what's wrong, and when they see something unjust happening to somebody we support, my goodness, they make a fuss about it, and then they come and tell me, I've had to do this, Katie, and I've had to do that, and um, that makes me really proud. 
And I love the phrase you used of being a social justice warrior. <laughs> and I thought, you know, uh, and when you said that, I thought, well, this was the card, you know. Mm. <laughs> and that you you're talking about um the, those examples that you've just given, it strikes me that decisions in the area of justice seem to be Andy, not not technically um justice in its formal sense, but the examples that you've given as well. Decisions seem to be being made on a kind of very rational slash technical basis rather than an emotional basis or from a place of love yeah absolutely yeah yeah a, a real kind of yeah real head over heart kind of decision making is made um, um rather than rather than yeah compassion led decision making yeah, yeah, compassionate is probably a better word than love. But even thinking about the um, the judicial system, I sometimes think that, you know, that we've all seen cases where you think, oh, my goodness, is that the right outcome? <clears throat> you know, whereas I, I, I don't know whether the history of justice is like this or not, but I would prefer a justice system where you had a really good, trusted wise judge who is making the right decision for everybody concerned and I know that you know that's that's asking an awful lot and not everybody's going to be pleased in these situations but for instance if somebody has committed an offense um you know rather than putting them away for a year a, a judge or somebody being able to say well I think you really need to go and work in the community and serve your time there. It, wouldn't that be better for society? Absolutely. Absolutely. I I was having a, a very similar conversation with my auntie and uncle. They're doing volunteering in a, um, a homeless support through their church. Uh, and they were telling me about a guy that was put in prison for a week. So... <laughs> just think how can a week do anything why why is he not serving his time in the community actually somebody showing him how to improve his life chances but also Im improve things for the community it's just it yeah it is very crazy mm. and then the other the other thing and I, again I'm conscious here that I'm kind of probably talking gross generalizations um, but it feels to me that somebody who commits a a petty crime that might be sensible, then ends up with a bunch of more hardened criminals that actually teach them how to be a proper criminal, yeah, rather than the person they went in as. And again, that that is just like suboptimal. You wouldn't do that, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, let, let, so let's um, turn it the other side of the coin and the more positive side of the coin. And uh, tell me about a time when you have experienced justice. Um, a time when I have, ex I mean, yeah, I, I guess if I if I use the examples that I the the examples of working with people affected by dementia. On the flip side of that, we do see lots of lots of great examples where people do get what they're entitled to, and people okay. do, do manage to yeah to get what they're um, what they yeah what they need out of life. Uh, um, we have worked really hard to sort of create a safety net around people, and um, and yeah, when you see people really having a a lovely time and you feel I I feel like there's a sense of justice in that because these people quite often they're older people so they've worked blooming hard during their lives uh, they've never ever thought that they would end up in a in a situation where they did have a reliance on other people or the state or whatever it is uh, um, they've worked really hard and then when you see see them kind of we, we see it quite often when people get first get diagnosed and I remember one particular lady who I, I got to know very well a couple of years ago 
she was absolutely broken when she got her diagnosis of dementia and um it absolutely crushed her and and then like a few years later to see how she'd made some friends she'd got well connected through the, the support that she was getting and and through her own tenacity and her own ability to kind of overcome the adversity that she'd faced uh, and she just used to always say to me I've I've worked really hard for my retirement and my life uh, um, I'm not going to let dementia mess it up not, not going to let dementia spoil it I'm going to focus on what I can do not what I can't yeah you, you're making me wonder actually about um, the different generations because like you've just mentioned presumably most of your work is with older people mm. um, and you mentioned tenacity and I, I tend to associate that with you know, generations before us, uh, so people that lived through the war and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, you know, when you hear the comments about um, Gen Z and Y and X and all the rest of it, I just wonder how they're going to cope when they are faced with something like this. And, I mean, I think it, it's looking far, far ahead for an organisation like yours, but is that ever something that you've contemplated about the, the, the way different generations might respond to something like this? Yeah, it, it really is something, you know, there's there's the obvious ones about what entertains the, the yeah. generation. But even as we kind of move through the generations, yeah, like the, the baby boomers, they're going to be a lot more demanding on us, whereas the people that are in their kind of 90s at the moment, they're just overwhelmingly filled filled with this sense of gratitude and so grateful if anyone helps them to do anything uh, um and then the sort of younger you know we work with people generally most uh, you know the highest prevalence of people with dementia is over 65 but you know there is there are people that are younger when they get diagnosed and there's um probably over 45,000 people in the UK that are diagnosed before the age of 65 uh, um and those, yeah, those people are going to be sort of quite, quite demanding and uh, set out their stall of what they do, what they do want and, and kind of know, yeah, know what they're entitled to, know what their rights are. Yeah. And then the, the generations after that, you know, they, they're developing a pretty sound reputation of being a bit flaky, aren't they? The, the younger yeah. ones uh, and kind of having all of the aspiration, but none of the willingness to put in the effort and the tenacity. So I can imagine ooh, they, they're going to be really difficult to deal with because they're just going to give up or some of them might. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine young people listening to this now just switching it off. <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're switching off in their droves, aren't they? Although <laughs> I, I will say in, in the younger people's defence, uh, I think it's yet to be seen what, um, what the impact of COVID will be on them. And um, I think that period of time in such a formative part of people's lives uh, is yet to really be kind of fully explored of what impact that have. And I, I think it might prove that this generation has got resilience, that, that perhaps that older generation that lived through the war has, but it will just show up very, very differently. Yeah. That's a, a great point. And it, it's a really, it fascinates me, this area. And I've had a, a, a number of conversations just in probably the last three or four months about this. And it's just like you said, for me, it's, oh, well, let's, let me rewind. When, you know, when we were, were allowed to interact again after the lockdown, I found, I don't know how you found it, but I found it quite awkward, actually. Um, and that's despite the fact that I've had like 40 years of practice of social interaction. Um, and then you take, say, a 13 or 14 year old who's right at the beginning of learning all of that stuff and then is locked down for two years and probably two years when they're at their most, you know, they're like a sponge at that time, aren't they? Just mm -hmm. taking everything in and accelerating so fast in development. And that was taken away. And then the school system, it seemed to me as a layperson, when COVID finished, the school system said, Oh well, that's it. That's finished. Then back to back to the way we were, and that is just impossible. You can't take away two years at that age and then restart. And a guy I was speaking to in Australia, he what he said was that 
he thinks it's going to be a bit like uh, the experience with um, military service in Vietnam in the US, where they didn't realize for decades afterwards what the real impact was. Um, um, and yet there doesn't seem to be very much interest or attention on the whole area. No, no, there, there really doesn't. Um, yeah, it seems to have just all kind of been forgotten about, doesn't it? But I think I, I do think it will, decades later it will come out the impact that this has had on all of us, really, but particularly on that younger younger generation. Um, mm. So to to lift our spirits a bit, <laughs> there's a big question on the card, which is how could more justice improve the world? And for a social justice warrior, that must be a brilliant question. It, it, that's quite a good question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I think if, yeah, if, you know, one thing that absolutely astounds me is when you look at any um, any information that comes out about inequalities and health inequalities particularly, and you find out that, you know, in one neighbourhood of, of one part of a county or a city or whatever, those people's life expectancy can be like up to 10 years shorter than than people who live in down the road because they're living in a in a more affluent yeah. uh, less deprived area so i think if there was more justice um around people's access to resource and not just in kind of financial resource but you know i again i think back to my own personal experience and we've just been talking about covid but you know, my experience and my family's experience and my children's experience of that was so so very different to to perhaps people less than a mile away from from us uh, and um and so that yeah i think you know if we can if we could really look at how how there could be less inequality um in the world and and i see i do see that as justice so uh, I know some people might, people might think, oh, you know, if there was more justice in terms of criminal justice, but I, I really see it about people, yeah, there being fairness and equal access to, to, to what people need, uh, then I think that that would make a huge difference to the world, not just in the UK, but everywhere really, wouldn't it? If, if um, a lot of our problems would be solved if, if there was a, a kind of fairer, distribution of of wealth and um and people's access to to basic human needs and wants uh and um, if i yeah if i can't if i can't feed my family if i can't look after my kids if i can't afford su suitable housing then that changes everything for me in terms of um how i experience the world and um and the chances that i'm going to have for uh, um, if we could if we could equalize that a little bit more in some way and I think I'm absolutely passionate obviously I would say this being a CEO of a charity but I'm absolutely passionate about the way that charities can help uh, in that situation and I think um, we are so overlooked particularly in some aspects of the mainstream media and um, in political life about how charities do really come in and and help make the world a bit more of a just place to live in and a bit more of a fairer place to be. Yeah, I've I've always kind of um, had a bit of a struggle with the concept of charities, actually. I have to share with you because for me, in a, in a just world, there wouldn't be a need no. for charitable organisations, right? Because society would take responsibility and deal with this stuff. So that that kind of makes me feel bad that you know people like you should even have to do what you do um and there's a there's a phrase um that i came across in the corporate world um and it's about leadership and culture and i'll see if i can get it right it's something like um the culture is determined by the worst behavior accepted by leadership and the just the guys, uh, the authors, I think, are called Grunert and Whitaker. I think they're called. Anyway, when I saw that, and I think I was having a conversation about society, and I was thinking, well, you know, the equivalent for me of that that quote is that society 
should be or society's leaders uh, can be judged by the way they allow their most vulnerable citizens to exist. And I agree with you that whether it be in the UK or on a global basis, we, why is it that we allow what we allow? I, I, I just don't understand it. Like somebody I was talking to the other day, they said that 30% of the people that live within like a one mile radius of them used food banks. That's in the UK. Yeah. And the UK is supposed to be a developed country, whatever that means. So I don't get that. Um, you have people like the ex-home secretary saying that living on the street is a lifestyle choice. Yeah. You know, even if you think that in a position like that, what what makes you use the words? It's, it's absolutely astounding, isn't it? And absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, it did that did provoke quite a strong reaction, but even so she yeah she put it out there and it's just fundamentally not true is it it's you know who would nobody would choose to live in a tent but um yeah I think I I, you know I could get could get quite on my political high horse about this how could more justice improve the world but if if yeah if if people just had that greater sense of of things what is fair and what isn't fair then she would never have said that because it wasn't it's not fair to use people that are living on the streets whether she believes that doing it by choice or not, it's not fair to use them to make her own political points uh, to, um, to to garner the attention that she, want, she wants. Um, yeah, and, and what you just said there about understanding uh, what is and what isn't fair, I think might be um, part of the either cause of this or part of the solution, or maybe it's both. Because I just can't help but feel that people like her, and to give her the benefit of the doubt, because of her privilege, she just doesn't understand. You know, hopefully that's the the situation. Um, And if you take it to a macro scale, um, I was on a call, uh, it's it's a values-based group that's connected to the G20. And we were on a call and somebody said, well, the G20 has two main objectives. Uh, I can't remember what the first one was. And the second one is prosperity. Right? And I just, I, I don't tend to do this that often, but I found myself kind of triggered by it. And I was like, hold on a minute, guys. What are you talking about prosperity? Wouldn't it be far better for the G20, you know, the most wealthy, powerful countries in the world, to be looking to achieve dignity for every human citizen for instance so why are we striving for prosperity when people are starving to death and haven't got clean water and haven't got education haven't got medicine why why are we saying oh prosperity is what we should all be about don't get it no no that yeah and and that seems to me to be the way of driving inequality rather than than reducing it because yeah you know th- th- those with resource those with the capability end up will always end up taking a greater share yeah and uh, what do you think about that point around you know people just not getting it just not because because it's we we live in a society although we've got social media it feels like we do exist in our own little bubbles kind of thing. And maybe because of that, we just don't get the reality of how other people exist and live. Yeah, I, 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 I to- totally agree. I think, um, and uh, where, where I live in Kent and where I work, obviously I know the area pretty well and, and you can see this so, so acutely. You can, you can be in one part of Kent and it's beautiful and it's it, you know every everything's hunky dory and then you can drive 30 minutes to another another place and interestingly I was having this conversation with my board of trustees where we were thinking about oh, okay how do we make the charity sustainable and a lot of people were saying well you know we could charge for some of the things we do we could ask people to pay uh, and I was like yes you can when you're sat here in this lovely golf course that we've a golf club room that we've hired for the day to do our team away day 
if I drove you 30 miles down the road to the Isle of Sheppey, where it's one of the most de deprived communities in the country, not just in Kent, in the country, and if we were sat there, there, do it, having this conversation, we wouldn't be able to be thinking about how how we how we make our organisations sustainable by charging people. And they were like, oh, God, yeah, yeah, get that now. So I, I do think, and it's an in inevitable, isn't it? Because I think something very human about us is it all is, you know, looking through our own bias, our own lens and seeing seeing the world through that. It's, it's inevitable, I think you know coming back to our our theme of the conversation maybe that's something about justice is uh, challenging ourselves to look look at things look at the world through somebody else's lens rather than our own our own lens and our own privilege um, and that that's where I was going with this I was thinking you know if if only there was a better way for us to have a better understanding of how other people live then perhaps we would be more motivated to do something about it and I remember um, I used to work in a corporate organization and we did a um, it was like a volunteering type day where you went and saw homeless people and all of this sort of thing and it had a long-lasting impact on many of the people that were involved because it was first-hand rather than reading about it or a report and all of that sort of stuff and there's a lady uh, in Brazil that I know. Um, she runs a a student virtual exchange system. So basically, um, somebody from a grammar school in Canterbury can be connected with some kids on the outskirts of Nairobi, and they can each see how each other lives and experiences the world. And when I found out about this, I was I was thinking, goodness me, if we because I think we can rely on kids to be to do the right thing ultimately. Yeah. And if if there was a way to at that stage help people to understand what exists in the world, then perhaps as they grew older and were in a position to do something about it, they would be more inclined to do that. And so I wonder whether our children are the key to this broader view of justice that you're outlining here mm -hmm. now there's a there's a also an opportunity for you to create a, your own question about justice on the values jam card so if you were to think of a question ask your own question about justice beginning with who what where when why or how Oh, that is a that yeah, that's a t tricky one. But I suppose something in me is thinking about like what what small action could you take uh, to improve justice in the world? Because uh, I think there is something that we all could do differently. Uh, um, I I think sometimes some of these themes like justice and some of these real bigger kind of concepts uh, we we probably think you know I can't make a difference I personally cannot make a difference to what's going on in the world uh, but yeah I, I think it, it um this it's making me think of that quote by Eleanor Royal around rights you know where do rights exist if they don't exist in small places close to home and um and I think there's something about this you know where does justice exist if it doesn't exist in those small actions that we all take uh, um, on a daily basis, whether it's doing something to help make society fairer, help people, help make people, help people to take the right decisions and stay on the right path or whatever it is. Uh, but um, yeah. So, uh, you know, the small action I think I, I can take is uh, I can, um, I, th I can, I can share some more of this social justice warrior information that I've got and I can certainly share in the perspective for the perspective of people living with dementia and make yeah make society and the communities around us understand there is a real inherent unfairness that's going on in the world for people living with dementia at the moment and we can make some small actions to to, to all of us improve them yeah that's a great point and it 
When you do your work, when you're communicating with either partners or potential funders or even the people that you deal with that have dementia, what language do you use? Do you use the, is, you know, you said uh, something earlier about how you take on the system and all that sort of stuff. And so I'm just wondering, and you might already do this, but do you label yourselves as social justice warriors? Well, that's a really interesting point. And that's kind of a point that we're grappling with as an organisation at the moment. That We're just kind of thinking about where where we see our future and our, our sort of forward forward plans. Uh, and I and I think that I think we're going to have to increasingly do so because we'll get to a point where all the lovely, nice, fun stuff that's all taken care of. But there's still absolutely inherent problems in the system that mean that people living with dementia won't be able to live the life that they that they want to. So, yeah, I think we are going to have to increasingly kind of say, you know, say some of these things and point out some of these injustices a lot more, a lot more blatantly and a lot more bluntly. Mm. And that it just strikes me that that gets the emotional debate going rather than the rational debate. And the research, um, so research in the value space over the last, I think it's around about 25 years. Uh, so basically, uh, it shows that 25 years ago, our choices were made largely on a rational basis. So I, th I can't remember the numbers exactly, but I think it was something like 75% of our choices were made based on rationale. Now, 25 years later, the coin has flipped completely and it's something like 80% of our choices are made on an emotional basis and what's important to us and our values rather than the other way around. So for an organisation like yours, rather than explaining all of the reasons why as somebody should support you or work with you or whatever, for you to be saying, uh, we do this because it's fair, these yeah. people have worked really hard all their lives and why should they forego this dignity um, just because they've got uh, this condition? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, this this has reminded me of there was a conversation the other day. Um, it's uh, a company that uh, I, well, I don't even know if they're a company actually. They're, they're basically trying to um, provide a different style of education, so based on life skills rather than kind of a head full of facts and figures that you never use again in the rest of your life, and also around um, equality and justice and. Again, on the call, I, I just found myself, uh, I just said to the guy, I'm so pleased to hear the work that you're doing because, you know, it's not your fault where you're born. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's nothing to do with you. <laughs> Whether if that you were born in a council house of a single parent versus somebody who was a company CEO millionaire and, you know, you've got all of those privileges that you've just walked straight into. Yeah. It just, it does, it it's not just at all. And so those small things, um, what, what small thing, what can I think of? I think for me, rather than if somebody does something wrong, you know, we were talking earlier about the, the justice system and prisons and all that sort of stuff. I think like a lot of people, if I see something wrong, I tend to go, oh, you know, there's going to be a punishment or whatever there is. Whereas perhaps the Zulu way uh, maybe not to that extreme, but something like that kind of philosophy. And then also explaining the why. I think that's really important. Uh, so that in that situation, rather than just being punished, people understand the difference between the right and the wrong. Um, yeah, but in in the heat of battle, I'm, <laughs> you know, I wonder how, how successful that's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so let's um, let's and the your choice of the question actually is a, a brilliant one, Katie, because it brings us to uh, the final question, and so hopefully we'll both have something in our minds to help us with this one, and that is, 
what is it that you're encouraged to do differently about justice as a result of our conversation today? So, yeah, I mean, I think it's it goes back to that that previous question that I that I thought of. I think for me, it it, it is probably about yeah framing framing the work that we do and my communication and articulation of that around the fairness or unfairness and the just or unjust world that we that we are kind of creating for people living with dementia and um doing quite a lot of work with our Kent-based charities to kind of help us all collectively work together and promote the work that we're doing. So yeah, one thing that I will be encouraged to do after today's conversation is have this conversation with my peers of um, CEOs of other charities as well and bring bring cut some of that into like, yeah, I think we're all, we're all articulating the changes that we make, but perhaps not this kind of, not framing it through the the kind of what's just and unjust and I think we could all make a little bit more of a stronger impact if we did frame it like that wow I'm I'm smiling big inside because you know I, a CEO of a charity as a result of a values jam conversation is thinking <laughs> about how they frame the bit wow that's amazing mine's much smaller so mine's uh, about you know in a situation where somebody's done something wrong and I'm thinking pro- you know in my personal life now um rather than jumping to well this is a punishment more about explaining what's fair what's not why um and then maybe not shying away completely from consequences but making it the other person's choice so you know if you do this then that's what's going to happen so it's up to you rather than you me be the person that lays it on the line so wow what a brilliant values jam thank you so much thank you i've thoroughly enjoyed it all right take care katie thank you